Hi, I'm Willy G, founder of the Hope Files Ministry. My life has always been a very curated, glamorous vision of bliss until a series of personal tragedies made me ask some life-altering questions. Is this it? Is this all there is to life? Join me as I journey to find stories from ordinary people with impactful lives, passion, wow. and vision to learn what drives them, what they yearn for, and what catapults them beyond their wildest dreams or expectations. What inspires hope? I first heard about our guest Brakusta Jack when I was a young woman living in Johannesburg. I saw his wedding photos in a magazine, I think it must have been Drum Magazine, and I thought to myself, this is a bold character, a fearless man. And that is how I formed my first opinion about our guest. Later on in life, when I worked in radio, I met him. And apart from my father filling in the political details over the years, I pieced together an extraordinary life. And in addition, discovered that he's probably one of the most down-to-earth people I've ever met. And his story gives us a little glimpse as to why. The story of Mkuseli Kusta Jack begins on a farm called Moskra, where he was born in Humansdorp. He was one of eight children, the son of Figile and Alice Jack. He describes his upbringing on the farm as the simple life. From early on in his life, however, one thing was evident. He would fight for the right to education, and it would be a central theme throughout his life. After being denied schooling early in his life due to illness, he started later than his peers. And in addition, when he eventually began schooling, it was interrupted when he was told that he could not attend school because he did not have a permit to be in the area. This led to his involvement in protests and demonstrations, demanding an education for all. So, uh, Kusta, thank you so much for chatting to us. Um, it's actually quite a privilege because looking at your history, I think to myself, wow, it's quite epic. It's epic because you were part of an incredible time in our country's history. But even more so, what strikes me is that where you started out, you couldn't have possibly imagined it would turn out that way. So looking back, um, tell us a little bit about the early years and what your aspirations were. Things were such that, you know, the aspirations were non-existent. Uh, maybe I could have qualified to be trusted by the farmer to count uh, the sheep or the cattle. Wow. Yes, that's... Uh, a simple life. Yes, that, 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 that would have made it for me in the early days. <laughs> I mean, starting with a terrible, chronic and debilitating asthma, mm. like the one I had, oh, yes. really. I mean, that ambition of even being allowed to count uh, the sheep was uh, totally remote. I got politically involved by default, really. Mm. Uh, I think if there was no problem with the pass law, I came into the school, just got fit in like a glove, maybe. I would have never been uh, uh, thought of being a polity in politics. Yes. So, because I had to fight now and to think of way to justify my stay here. Yes. And I was ready to listen to anyone who was criticizing the system that was keeping us out. And that is how really my curiosity of politics started to be formal. A quest other, for education. Yes, but other than that, really, I had just a sense of justice a natural sense of justice emanating from the life experience of farm, yes. laborer mm. uh, relationship. I had this sense of justice, okay? Yeah. And uh, which was natural, which was not influenced by anything like politics, something okay. like that. And also I had uh, uh, attitude towards bullies and yes. bullying. And if you can check then, obviously, the whole system of oppression is about bullying. Exactly. And because that, you become immediately on a collision course with me, inside me, it makes me very uncomfortable when people bully other people. I don't care how powerful they are. Mm -hmm. Even if I know I don't stand a single chance of winning, I will never take the side of a bully. It doesn't matter what. So because of that, and I think 
another thing, I, I love, I love uh, order. I love, uh, 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 you know, doing things in a systematic way. Kusta's role as the chair of the South African Students' Movement and being chosen as the head prefect in 1979 meant that he was often thrust into positions of leadership. Following the banning of South African Students' Movement, he was among those who established the Congress of South African Students in Port Elizabeth. What followed as the years went by were numerous arrests and bans throughout the late 70s and 80s. In 1986, Mkuseli Jack was detained under the state of emergency laws and only released from St. Albans Prison in Port Elizabeth on the 16th of May, 1989. I had no intentions ever to be on a leadership podium leading yes. anybody. I know you're quite humble when you talk about uh, this call to leadership because obviously people singled you out as someone who stood out and fought for a very valuable cause. So there must be some leadership qualities in you. Or is it something that you learned as you went? Did you find that with people's trust, you've, you shouldered a responsibility greater well, than what you imagined? Yeah. In those days, it was difficult to be a leader because leadership carried a heavy responsibility. Meaning that, I mean, there were things that you are not expected to say, you're not expected to do, especially negative things. Mm. Uh, of course, it wasn't calling for angelic uh, kind of uh, uh, way of life out of people, mm. but it was unwritten that if you are a leader, you are expected that you won't hurt other people. All right? Mm. You will not throw your weight and power mm. and to make other people uncomfortable and hurt them. And that kind of uh, a behavior, it was that uh, requirement, mm. if you like, or conduct, was useful for yourself because you need that. With being in the struggle, there was a big sacrifice being under leadership. There was no such thing as people who could fight for being in leadership. Mm. <laughs> People are fighting to run away from, from leadership. leadership. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Even to, to pretend to be a leader was deadly. Mm. Remember, there was no question of, there's no evidence of the dangers. They were there in front of us. I mean, by 76, early, there's already about three or four high profile uh, political activists that were already hanged. I mean, uh, who died in detention, let alone those who were being hanged mm. and those that were being sent to Robben Island or to prisons or having to flee the country. So you knew the price? The price was written all over the place. So by the time the, the likes of uh, Mohapi Mopeka died yes. and uh, the, the likes of the great uh, 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 Joseph Mkhuli and the others and uh, uh, Tiro, in earlier years, we're all there to show that it was not a joke to try and stand up for people. It was costly that made people to make a choice and said, okay, do I want to be humiliated in silence or do I want to die in an attempt trying to break down the system that was in front of me? Basically, that was what it was. And then the people who would take such a sacrifice for you to be able to withstand torture, yes. to be tortured, to be in solitary confinements for days, to be threatened, and to be told that you are nothing, because that was, the, first of all, as you know, the security police start by explaining to you that, oh, bully G, what a wonderful, how do you mix with this lot of the guys, eh? I mean, we know, yes, you are angry, apartheid is bad, but unfortunately, no, you know the Bible is, we, this is based, God created us mm. this way, and so we on and the so Bible on. But yes, please, please, don't worry. You know what? You're a sweet child, you are brilliant, your family has no track record of being, <laughs> of, of being uh, uh, naughty and so on and so on, okay? Why do you, okay, first that's what they do. And then they talk nicely with you on a nice cup of coffee and then yeah. 
And then it escalates. It escalates because you don't stop. They were suggesting to you, stay away from these guys. As a leader, Rakusta faced many arrests and paid the price of a delayed education in his quest. He describes this time as one in which the support of comrades and mentors was invaluable. One of his earlier mentors was a theologian, and he speaks candidly about his influence on his life, as well as his faith journey at the time. He highlights this part of his life in his book. Well, I was lucky, you know, uh, in that I came across <laughs> two, two uh, 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 stories of the Bible, yes. okay? There was, uh, uh, there was a story in the Bible that appeared to me to be preaching justice and was really touching on, what, on our personal experience. We were removed from the farm badly. So, and then one day I heard a preacher preaching about the queen uh, Jezebel and the king who, who grabbed somebody's land, okay? And then on the other hand, we had a relative, which I write a lot about in the book here, yes. who was a Dutch reform uh, kind of lay preacher. Mm. He was not educated, but he could read the Bible. I don't know how you do that. But uh, he had, uh, also was telling us about the day of judgment, what calls the day of judgment. You know, he used to frighten hell out of us to such an extent that you could believe that. He has participated in numerous judgments before. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. But anyway, so even there, I pulled some curiosity. Yes. Remember, my family, we, we, we have never been to any city. We have never stayed on any city. We are undiluted, amakosa, you know, yes. as they call them, amakaba. You know, the red people. That's a bit harsh. Yes, we, okay. yeah, that's what we were. We were proud to be a macabre, meaning that we are undiluted by Western influence yes. or any other influence. We're growing up the way we are supposed to grow. <laughs> so, but because of this, I got curious now about the Bible again. Mm. <laughs> but to leave that now, let's talk about the modern preachers. Yes. Then I come to the city here. After the student uprising of 1976, yeah we saw the local clergymen, respected people, mm. standing in the pulpit, condemning the system of apartheid, oppression and injustice and social degradation and the exploitation of our people. I say, wow. Then I, I follow these guys, it's wherever they were speaking. Mm. And it was at the time especially at the time of the student uprising, when they were coming in, a, in meetings, protest meetings to speak there or at the funerals of those who were shot by the security police. Mm. That is when our great theologians yes. rose to the occasion, you know, and took the lead. And given their moral standing at that time and their ethics, it was easy to develop the leaders that were going to come up later on yes. in those strong ethical values and uh, moral grounds. For me, what strikes me is that you called the title of your book to survive and succeed. Yeah. Because people think about survival in basic terms, like you're surviving, whereas I would say you've thrived and succeeded. <laughs> well, it's a relative. Yes, it is. But, you know, for me, I could, a person who has uh, repeated wasted four years of schooling, yes. okay? Remember, the first four years were not done. Yes. <laughs> you, you had challenges. <laughs> you had challenges. Yeah. And then another four. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you go and make species in Hraf Reynet and you, get, you come back, you get expelled in two schools in one day. For political activity. That's not a child's play. And I try and go and hide in the sea sky. I got identified by a comrades and they put me on a platform to speak at the funeral memorial service of Dr. Neil Aggett, yes. who was killed at the John Foster Square. I mean, there, I end up in jail in the sea sky for like three months. I mean, 
my schooling is gone. At the age of 24, I haven't dealt with the matric. My children, my daughter is 22. She has already finished her honors degree now. She, she's shocked when I tell her, at 24, I haven't even <laughs> completed my matric and put it aside. It was a different time. Okay, yeah, that's it. So that is why I think really this was a matter of survival. You know, of a great magnitude. Bracusta was tasked with organizing the rally to welcome Nelson Mandela back after his release from prison. And at the time, he was president of the Port Elizabeth Youth Congress. He met the Mandelas in Soweto, Johannesburg, and invited them to Port Elizabeth. This was the start of a new direction in his life, and he made the decision to leave politics behind. After Nelson Mandela was freed, I decided that, gosh, I call it quit, uh, because I was so exhausted. I never had a life of a young person. And uh, I thought, for me, it was just the end of the story yes. in terms of liberating the country. The reason for that was simply because it was a shock that we were going to be uh, uh, running the lap of honor. Yes. I never thought it would fail. It. No, 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 we never. None of us, I can tell you that. Mm. Anyone who tells you that we thought that we were going to be liberated in our lifetime is joking. Mm. We knew freedom will come for our generation and other people, but, and the following one, but not ourselves. We never saw. For me, when that came, I said, wow, I can't believe this. And I raised that actually when, that was my first remark to Nelson Mandela when I heard that he was going to be free. I said, the day you walk out here, I'm going to quit politics forever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and then he walks out. Yeah, and he did. And then after that, gosh, I just got involved on in the early days of the activities that were around his release. And then after that, I parted ways. I left I, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, not because I was thinking there's something wrong that is going to happen. I was yeah. just, yeah, no, I thought that it was a release. It was just, I didn't want to anymore. I thought I could, I could live a life of a normal person, which uh -huh. I thought could be good and so on. And then I went to study. First of all, I got married. Yes. Yes. After to I got Karen. married, yes, to Karen, my wife. And then after that, I packed my bags and went to study overseas because I wanted really to cut off and not be distracted. And, uh, and things went well for me. I went to study and I came back after that. After that, I went for, to work in the corporate. And then I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. So you just wanted a life of normality after... I wanted a life of normality, a life of a middle class, black person or South African, if you like. Uh, whereby I could have a house that I call my home, have uh, be able to send my children to the school of our choice and to, to take holidays where I want to, to have dogs and cats. Okay, we didn't have the cats and I thought I was going to have two dogs, <laughs> which is a life of a middle class and be able to go to the hospital, my children to be born in the hospital where I choose, to, uh, you know. Because those were all things that you didn't grow up. Yeah, yeah, to. yeah, of course, mm -hmm. I didn't. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. Uh, so I, I wanted that life and I saw that the new South Africa was bringing that to all South Africans, not to me only. So that was sufficient for me. I didn't need to be a politician and hope that I can live. So I was happy to, to live that life. As an author, Mkuseli Jack is mindful that our stories will be valuable to future generations and not only give them a sense of belonging and history, but also give our past heroes the acknowledgement they deserve and to serve as a catalyst for change. The young people today, uh, the problem is that they have to, they want quick results. Instant gratification. Yes, because you can't get that in a situation where you are going to deal with a system. That was as powerful as apartheid. Yes. Just as well as today. I mean, if you're going to deal with corruption, mm -hmm. you think that you're going to shout one, two, three, and then it, it, it evaporates oh, into yeah. thin air. You are, you are dreaming. It's not going to happen. 
It's going to be. Look, the struggle against corruption has not even started in this country. And against other issues like poverty. I mean, uh, all those together. things, everything. You, 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 people, for that to happen, sacrifices are going to be made by mm -hmm. those who want to change things. Not by just talking. When you talk, you are just encouraging the criminals mm -hmm. or those uh, rogues that just are doing the, the wrong things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I am of the view that uh, you need to be patient and not hope to be the one that is going to run the, the lap of honor for this. It's not, once you do that, then unfortunately, over optimism kills also. Husta's passion for South Africa is clearly evident and he expresses a new hope for our country as he praises the work of activists from all corners. Those were the great people and there are so many and many. I mean, if you think of Miriam Makeba, Okay, Dorothy Masugu. You look at their songs in those days. And not only that generation, even in our generation, go at the songs of uh, Lucky Dube yes. and others, and you hear what the people are saying. These are people who were driven by a vision of a united, non racial, prosperous South Africa. They were yearning for that. Mm -hmm. And it is our job is to restore. That memory, it's going to come back anyway. Look, I mean, I, I have a very high hopes for our country and I think that we're going to get out of this problem and uh, South Africa will prosper and be what we dreamt it was going to be. And uh, then it will be going back to the days when we as South Africans, we were so highly respected in the world. When we came around everybody, you know, uh, raise his head in pride of us. And I think the new, uh, very soon, the new generation that is picking up that kind of uh, uh, mantra will be able to, to, to know that uh, they will be rewarded and the world will respect us and give us our rightful place in the <laughs> family of nations. That's beautiful and it's a perfect place to end off the highest hope for our nation. <laughs> what I found most fascinating about Bracusta's story is that his political accomplishments and life are well documented, and so too his business successes. But today, after hearing his story, I'm quite pleased to say that him becoming an author means that his spiritual life now receives equal billing in the history books. They told